Welcome to Scoreography, a podcast about the greatest sport on ice, figure skating. I'm Wendy Buskey. And I'm Adrian Buskey. And this episode is our wrap up for Skate America 2024, which, as we indicated in the previous episodes, we were actually in person to see. What an experience. Yeah, that qualifies in a lot of different ways, actually. <laughs> uh, I, the event itself was awesome. I mean, we had a fabulous time both seeing the skating, just being there in person to soak up all the energy of it while also struggling with some exterior frustrations that made some of the trip a little problematic, which mostly just came down to, let me put it this way, who's not going to get gold in our hearts this week is either Alamo rental cars or <laughs> Nissan vehicles, because our rental vehicle that we got died on us on Saturday morning, right when we were going to go to the venue for the event. Yeah, that part, not so much fun and unfortunately took a little bit more time from our trip than we would have liked. So we had less time to engage with people. There were several folks that had messaged us hoping to like say hi. And I apologize if we didn't get back to you. We had some chaos. <laughs> so maybe next time we'll get to actually say hello. Oh, yeah. Saturday night, we had to spend over two hours sitting in a parking lot waiting for a tow truck. And then when the tow truck got there, we found that the car could literally not even be put into neutral. So it had to be drug out of the parking space. And I didn't know that was possible. Yeah, new cars are weird, man. Like uh, <laughs> That's a whole other rant, but it yes. certainly made for some problems as far as logistically trying to fix all those issues. And it was pretty annoying. So we ended up just Ubering the rest of the trip. Yes, but thankfully we did meet a few really wonderful listeners. So thank you if we got to spend any time with you. That was completely wonderful. Also, we did thankfully get to see all of the events other than the practices. But somehow through all of that, we still managed to see every competitor. It's funny when you've got a full skating event and you're like us and you're watching every single discipline, even at home, that can be a little taxing sometimes because it's just a lot to take in and you can spend a lot of time on the couch trying to absorb all of it. But in person, it's even kind of weirder because it is this sort of roller coaster of emotions of like really, really big highs and then these big dips between competitions or when somebody has kind of a poor skate and it's exhausting. You know, it it's, really is. It's a lot of time in the seats and it can really kind of wear you out. So by the time we were done, I kind of needed a couple of days of non skating stuff. Yes. Just to kind of let my brain come down from it and return to some normal kind of brain space. But it was still, it was really fabulous. I want to note something I thought was really funny is there's a question that we have a lot as viewers, which is that when you watch a lot of skating on TV, you start to recognize certain people in the audience <laughs> that show up a lot. There's a handful of them that are kind of like, yes, that we're, we're, the super fans. And a lot of other viewers have noted before that there's a pair of women who always wear matching pink jackets that are almost like all the international events. You They're everywhere. You see them all the time. And we had wondered about that. I'm like, I wonder if we'll see the pink jacket ladies. Yeah, we did. They were in the row in front of us. Yes, we saw them every day and we didn't talk to them. I felt like we should have, but we didn't. Yeah. <laughs> so if you've watched the event or if you still are going to go back and restream any of it, if you happen to see the two of them, look to their right and you'll see a couple of people in masks and that's us. Yes. We're just a few <laughs> people away from them. So we found that very entertaining. We also very, very briefly got to meet Jean-Luc Baker, which was both exciting and also I felt super bad because he was talking to other folks and we were running to our Uber <laughs> yes, and just was, gushing at him. It was like, literally like opening up the door to the Uber and being like, Jean-Luc Baker, we love you and you were so great in the, the last Honest and Perspectives with Kate and we really miss you. Bye-bye. <laughs> yes. But, I promise we're not weird. <laughs> yeah. But he was a total sweetheart. He was. We saw a lot of other skaters out and about while we were exterior from the event, but we, for the most part, tried to not engage because they all have their own thing going on. Yes. So, you know, we try to give people space and everything. So like Wendy was saying, if we did get to meet you there, we're so pleased. Thank you for coming up and saying hi. If we missed you, deepest apologies for that. Also at the venue, sometimes we really had a hard time getting phone signals. So it was a challenge to kind of keep up with comments and stuff while we were there as well. And then, you know, 
also spending chunks of our time on the phone with rental companies, sitting in oh a car gosh. as it got gets towed, calling them and demanding our money back, all those kinds of things. So I do have video footage of Adrian getting dragged while in the car <laughs> by the tow truck, if anyone's interested. <laughs> it is pretty funny. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, enough about all of that stuff. So we're going to get in and start talking about the competition. Yes. And this one is going to be a little different in flavor because of our having been there in person experiencing it like the live audience, which distinctly does not have any of the score box stuff on the screen. At home, you're often sort of counting elements. You can see when things are under review. If you have commentary, they might call out an under rotation or something that, you know, you didn't notice. But in person, you don't have any of that. And oftentimes the skaters can be in an opposite corner of the arena where you can't really see a jump land really well. So there are definitely places where we could think, oh, that looked really good. And then find out later it was cue call or an under rotation or something because we literally just couldn't see it. I think I have a much better appreciation and understanding for why skaters sometimes look utterly baffled by what occurred. And not that I ever really question that. It, it makes sense because they're going so fast and in a blur that they probably don't always know when they've landed on the queue or something like that. But this particular competition had quite a few of those moments. So basically all of that to say, we're probably going to get some stuff wrong because we haven't gone back to watch the video footage, the slow-mos. So feel free to correct us if we're like, hey, this should have been scored higher. And you're like, nah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, and also we came home and immediately had to jump into client deadline projects and big stuff. Work. So work <laughs> life. So, I mean, this episode is even coming out a little bit late because we just really have had so little time after yeah. getting back from Texas. But I think that where we should start off is what I would think of as the sort of pinnacle of this whole event. Which is Kevin Amos. Which is definitely Kevin Amos. <laughs> But is the men's competition in general because of everything that we went to, that was the most exciting, thrilling performances. A lot of these guys really left it all out on the ice. But let's start at the top with Ilya Malinin with the gold medal win. Ilya Malinin is, I think, undeniable at this point. It's not that he is unbeatable. He proved here that he can be vulnerable at times. Not that he still didn't win by eight points, but eight points isn't much for Ilya Malinin as we saw last year at Worlds. So I do think that with some mistakes in his very good free skate, he still showed that he is beatable. However, what I took away from watching him in both his short and his long, and actually even more so in his exhibition, he has made enormous strides in his his own version of artistic ability. It's not traditional, but it's his. And he has crazy amounts of charisma on the ice. Yeah, I think that ongoing criticism of about him not having artistic ability really needs to go out the window here. It is subjectively not going to be to everybody's tastes. And some people will harp on his edges and knees and stuff, I, which I don't know. But that's skating skills. That's not so much artistry. I sure. feel like they're different. Yeah. What I think that Ilya brings to the ice beyond just his incredible acrobatic ability is just a very modern style that's quite a bit different from some of the things that we've seen before. And he is ever sharpening it into something extremely distinct. And it is a thrill to see in person. And we talked about way back when in our Stars on Ice episode where we saw him live for the first time in a traveling exhibition show. And his charisma and excitement on ice is undeniable. And seeing it here, it's even expanded further. So Yes, his free skate had some problems. He had a, a couple of jumps that didn't quite work, which is such a rare thing for Ilya. Just little lapses of concentration. But still, those programs were really, really fun with varying levels of intensity and great moments. And in the short program, he threw the raspberry twist right in front of us. Yeah. And that's a thing that on TV looks really cool, but it is a next level experience in person. It's I mean, it, you know, it happens so fast, but it's just astounding to see live when it's only a few feet away from you. And all of that was awesome. He didn't yes. throw the entirety of his technical ability at this one. And we didn't expect him to, you know, when we were in the preview episode, we figured he wouldn't 
throw the quad axle, that he wouldn't put everything out there because it wasn't expected that he would be up against really tough competition from a technical level. But what we did see here was him get beat in the free skate. Yeah. Which is a fairly astounding thing. But it really just comes down to the real story of this entire event, which is the redemption arc of Francis Kevin Amos. It's hard to even put into words what it was like being in the arena for that. In his short program, the tension was palpable from the moment he stepped on the ice for the warm up. It felt like everyone was watching him holding their breath. It was an educated crowd that knew that this was a big deal for Kevin. His short program, the only jump that we saw that had any issue was his first. And it wasn't bad. It was just a little scratchy. If you know Jackie Wong's uh, lingo, he hangs on, landed a little forward, nothing major. But from that point on, I think once he knew he was standing up on that jump, it all came together beautifully. It was incredible. And the crowd freaked out, like just absolutely loved it. His free skate, on the other hand, I don't even have words. It was unbelievable. From the moment he stepped on the ice till the moment he went into the kiss and cry in tears, that crowd was with him and loving him. It was just absolutely incredible. And I could not be happier for him. We said in the preview that after the disaster that was the two-thirds end of his previous season, that this event felt like the right place for him to reset himself. He had an extraordinary Skid America last year. You know, we were talking about how that Bolero there was at its peak. It was perfection at that event. Our thinking was, here's an event that went so well last year. It's an audience that's primed to appreciate him and support him. And this feels like a really good moment to reassert himself. And he did that to the nth degree, next level. I mean, I was hoping that Kevin would be great. I was not prepared for the incredible performances that he delivered. They were emotional. They were sublime. They were full of detail of artistry and acrobatics and excitement and vulnerable moments. And you really felt like he was telling a story. I think you said it afterwards that you felt like that free skate was him telling that story of overcoming last year. Yeah. And having heard his post-competition interview, it sounds like that's pretty close. But I feel like everyone that was watching it could relate to that. There was one specific moment where he was just going down the ice backwards, but facing towards where we were and just looking at his face. Like I could see it clearly in my mind right now. And it I felt so moved by him. Like, I felt like I was going to cry. The pain that he felt last year, listening to his post interviews, I don't know if you've heard them. He talked about how difficult that time period was in every way. And so it makes it even more special to have watched that and to have been in the building and seen how much all of not only his performance, but the crowd response, how much it all meant to him. And it's hard to even put into words, honestly. He got a standing ovation for both the short and the long, and he got another one for his gala performance, which was also electrifying and just gorgeous. This was a Kevin Amos, not just at the top of his previous game, but excelling what I think we've ever seen him do before. Mm-hmm. And Agreed. I don't know, looking ahead, if he'll be able to maintain that particular thing that he did there. But it was absolutely extraordinary. And I just feel so fortunate we were in the building to see that live. Yeah. Because the men's event in general, again, was the gem of this whole competition. But it was worth the price of admission to just see those three skates. They were extraordinary. Seeing him in the kiss and cry during (laughs) when his scores were coming for the free skate And him being so overcome that he literally launches himself out of the the kiss and cry and off to the staging area. We were right near there. So on camera, you would have just seen him disappear in person. We all got to see him bouncing off to the side in just losing it over that massive score. And again, he won the free skate here over Ilya. That's a big deal in this moment in time. And to jump from fourth to second onto the podium here, absolutely incredible. We could go on for an hour just about those performances, but (laughs) it really was spectacular. Let's move on to Japan's Kalmura. I was really excited to see Kao in person, but also because we had seen him earlier this season already not looking too sharp. I was a little concerned. My concerns were silly. He looked (laughs) great. He wasn't perfect, but he was 
really impressive. And I have to say, personally, I like his short program more than I like his free skate. Yeah. That said, I love his power, his intensity. And man, you could tell in that free skate, he is so invested in what he's doing. I mean, there is no lack of commitment at any moment from Kalmura. The short program was dynamite. He seemed to have reined in all of those nerves and all of that wildness that we were worried about in the early Challenger events and delivered something that was extremely refined, that contained all of that energy, all of that intensity and aggression that he throws into his skating and really focused them to a fine point. It had the audience there in Allen, Texas, just losing it. It was awesome. Again, the last six skates or so were outstanding, and that one was definitely a highlight. I agree that the free skate isn't quite as strong as the short program, and it had little bobbles, but the emotional commitment that he brought to the ice there, you know, you're really seeing a guy working on giving you the story, the artistic expression. He's really come just a long, long way in a couple of years. Even though he slipped a little bit into third after the free skate, still on the podium, still a great start to his Grand Prix and looked so much better than the early part of the season. I was thrilled with it. Me too. In fourth, we had Nika Gatsay. He looked great in the short program. The free skate was good, but not great, I'd say. Again, seeing him live gave me a better appreciation, I think, of what he does. But if I'm being totally honest, Nika won the exhibition. So (laughs) it's a matter of like, okay, you didn't get a medal, but you got a standing ovation at the exhibition. (laughs) So good on you, Nika. Nika was in a tough space because in the groups he was skating in, he was skating with Ilya and Kevin and Denise and Cal and even Kashiro Shimada some of whom he has a much stronger technical wheelhouse than, but who are much more artistically evolved than him. And we've talked about in the past how we've been a little underwhelmed by Nika as far as like not necessarily always being able to live up to the drama of his material. I think he's come a long way this season, and I liked his programs here. It was just really hard to be sort of sandwiched between these extraordinary performances from some of these other veteran skaters who were getting these big standing ovations. And then Nika's is just a little bit of a come down. It is. Even as strong as he was technically, his jumps mostly looked really good. He said the short program was strong, but the redemption arc for him there is definitely his Deadpool gala performance. We talked about that in a previous episode because we'd seen him do it somewhere else. And it's like his guaranteed ticket to every exhibition. Absolutely. You're going to see it a lot this season. Yes. (laughs) The first time we saw it, it looked a little rough around the edges, but was still fun. Here, he had really gotten it together. And he was really into it. It's performed perfectly. If you're a Deadpool fan at all, he nails it. He gets all of the body language right. He gets all of the humor of it right. He actually was able to take his mask off in it this time, which then allowed him to actually do his jumps, which in the exhibition, I think, almost looked better than they had in competition. And you could see there, that's who Nika wants to be. Yeah, I mean, I think that was worth talking about is like his posture, his line was better Mm -hmm. doing his exhibition. It's like, maybe you need to loosen up a little bit (laughs) because you looked way better having fun. Yes. I was thrilled for him because the audience ate up the Deadpool performance. It was so good. He performed it so well. You could see even in the end when, you know, all the skaters are skating around the outer rink and, you know, high-fiving and waving to people and whatever. He was just so happy. It was clear he was just living for all of that. So I was just really, really happy for him that he got to have that big moment, even though he fell just off the podium, which is always a bummer. I think that having had such an extraordinary gala experience, hopefully that is like a nice takeaway from the whole thing. Well, I want to spend a minute talking about who came in fifth, Dennis Vasilios. Denise, I knew I was going to have a good time watching him. I did not know to the extent because I don't think I could have. He is so wonderful to see live and in person. He is such a crowd pleaser. It's ridiculous. He's so good. I wish his technical content was just a little bit higher and more reliable only because I want to see him on more podiums because he is such a wonderful performer. I just love him. You see it on TV and you know it's great, but seeing it in person is different. And he was brilliant in both his skates here. 
He's so charismatic. He's such a storyteller. He's such an entertainer. He, he makes so much eye contact. Like yes. so much eye contact with the audience. Like he is looking at you. You're going to like just melt into Denise Vasilias if you're watching him live. Well, definitely the, the woman next to us did because she was like a Denise Vasilias <laughs> super fan. And so she was really excited. She was filming him a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a pair and really three because, again, at the gala, he was also terrific. Oh, so and good. skating skills, artistry, performance value. We need touring skating shows back in the yes. States again because Denise Facilius should be a headliner for those things because there's hardly anybody who's as good at that as him. He was brilliant. Thrilled to have seen him here. Well, I know we're talking a lot about the men, so I'm, I want to just maybe go through some highlights of other folks and then we can move on. I really want to give a gigantic shout out to the two Americans, Max Namov and especially Luca Bersard. They were both wonderful, even though they were far from perfect. Luca had a really, I would call it disastrous short program. Max was pretty consistent, but not at his best. But in just performance value, Max is, again, a crowd pleaser, not to the same degree as like a Denise by any stretch, but he's getting there. He's building and like getting to see him live, especially his exhibition. I just loved. But Luca Bersard. My God, is he a talent. I cannot wait to see the evolution of Luca Bursard because I could see him, dare I say he could be the next Jason Brown. Luca's skating quality, his artistry, his lines, everything that he does on the ice is just exceptional. He just doesn't have consistent jumps. And he, I mean, in his free skate, he was throwing double axles. Because he had to because he he he... had fallen in the short program hard enough that he was still in pain. Yeah. So he had to water down his content. However, I'm sure if you watched the competition, you saw that he got a standing ovation, even with his watered down technical content. And it seemed to even surprise him. But that audience appreciated what he brought in terms of performance value. Yeah, as he gets more experience and develops as a skater, I really hope I could really see him being like the next generation Jason Brown because he has all of that fundamental and interpretive ability. And also he has this really great bit that he and Isabeau do (laughs) together in the gala exhibition, which is hysterical, where they pretend to be each other's coaches while they go out to do their performances. And it was really, really funny live. Super delightful. And Max Namov's uh, Ants Marching gala performance was his best thing that he did here, too. Absolutely. And, And his joy on ice and how he expressed it there in the gala was absolutely wonderful. Could have been a better competition, but still great skater. Also, I want to definitely shout out Kashiro Shimada uh, because Kashiro's short program was absolutely fabulous. He kind of fell apart in the free skate, and I don't really love that free skate on him. I don't quite get it, but also a great interpretive skater who brings a lot artistically and just a lot of genuine warmth uh, in his performances. He's so likable. And then, unfortunately, a last place finish for Mexico's Donovan Carrillo. He had a pretty disastrous free skate. However, you'll never take away from his performance ability. Oh, no. Donovan is such a crowd pleaser. And you have not heard a crowd lose their minds like they did just when he was announced for the warm up. It was huge. He is so beloved. And I hope that this is just, you know, it was a rough start, but it's early. Let's give him time. Yeah. Well, let's move on to the pairs because we've talked about the men for a while, (laughs) (laughs) which to anyone who has listened to this show ever, you're going to know that we were real happy (laughs) watching the pairs competition as the uh, first place went to Riku Mira and Ryuchi Kihara of Japan. We love Riku and Ryuchi. Uh, A lot. They they have been (laughs) our faves for a while. They are such spectacular skaters on so many levels. They bring a emotional component to pair skating that I just love. I was super worried going into this competition, one, that they just wouldn't be there. (laughs) You know, like we talked about that, where I was just nervous that something would keep them from being there. But more than anything, it was hoping that they'd be healthy because they've struggled with so many injury issues, particularly for Ryuchi. And yeah, what we got here was lovely. Two great competition skates, 
I know we're talking about the gala a lot and it's not the competition, but their gala performance was so joyful, so happy, so playful. It was messy, but their faces were just the best. It was just wonderful. Yeah. In competition here, they looked really strong. All of those throws, all of those lifts. Seeing their lifts in person, my God. I have a different appreciation for Riku. Having seen their lifts now up close and the way she locks into positions and really expresses throughout for being someone who's not, I mean, there's only one Diano Stellato Dudek in terms of that level of like radiating to the rafters. But Riku is so strong in the air and man, are they fast. So fast. I don't think I'd ever really appreciated before how quick they are as a team. In particular, just during the warmups, like Riku is way, way faster than I ever had any appreciation Same. for. And that's, you know, when they kind of split up and do their own thing during the warm up. But she is a speed demon and she just looks different on the ice. I've never appreciated it before, but she doesn't really skate like anybody else out there. There's something in her movements that's just different. And, and Ryu is just a beast. He's incredible. His strength is so impressive. I and mean, all the pairs guys are like yes. that. But it is just really impressive to watch and so much fun. So, yeah, I was thrilled. I, I was so happy with their performances here. I'm sure they could have been a little bit cleaner. But that just means they have a bigger ceiling and will score better later in the season. Yeah, but they still won this by almost 13 points. So they were clearly on top here. But the second place finish for the U.S.'s Ellie Cam and Danny O'Shea was really promising and really encouraging because this is a team that we have worried a little bit about after last season, what they were going to be able to accomplish. So far, they've been having a strong season and their skates here were awesome. They were so great live. I am a fan. I've liked them as a partnership and they've always looked beautiful together and they've just struggled with the throws and some of the side by sides at times. I am a fan now, like officially I will sign up for the fan club. <laughs> like they were extraordinary on so many levels. I feel like they're the thrill seeker team if seeing some of their moves, but their lifts are really impressive, especially in terms of the entries. They always have interesting lead up. They don't do anything the same that everyone else does. At least it doesn't seem like that in the moment. I'm sure if I go back and watch the replays, I will maybe feel differently. I don't know. I was a little overwhelmed, honestly. I just thought that they've just come so far. I felt like a proud mom or something. I was just like, this is so good. Yeah, I agree that their entries into their throws, to me, feel harder and more complicated than what almost anybody else is doing. The big thing that I took away from it, though, was how much improvement that team has shown with their emotional connection and their emotional delivery on the ice, particularly after the free skate. I was just struck at how great Ellie was. Like, I don't know that I'd ever appreciated her as much as I did after those two skates, but particularly the free skate. They've just come together so much stronger. There's been lots of improvements. They can still work a little bit more on some of those landings and some of those jumps. But even then, it's a night and day difference versus last season. Massive and, difference. Um, and I'd have to give them the shout out because in the gala, they did a K-pop song. <laughs> there was K-pop. They did 5050s Cupid and in the Korean language version, which I thought was awesome. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I was even more thrilled with them. And it, like you were saying about the thrill seeking, the gala showed a lot of stuff where people did things that they weren't throwing in competition that were wild. But Danny and Ellie's exhibition had some genuine like, oh, you guys are scared of nothing kind of stuff <laughs> where I was like, I am terrified and thrilled. You know, it's like being on a roller coaster and being upside down. We were like, this is great. It's terrifying, but it's great. That was what it was like watching them. Uh, they were incredibly awesome at that. But overall, yeah. As a surprise third place, I feel proud of myself because I've been talking about this team already this season as a keep an eye on them. Fomova and Mitrofanov from the U.S., there is no way I would have predicted them being bronze medalists at Skate America, but here we are. And their free skate, phenomenal. Yes. They barely squeaked out this third place finish. Oh, I mean, it was just, really close. It was really, really close over the fourth place. Less than a tenth of a point. Yes. But their performances were great. Alyssa was much better in her landings. Misha is so impressive. I just, it's such an impressive pairs partner. I was just really struck with the growth of both their technical abilities, but their charisma on ice, the strength of their pairing, 
That free skate was really awesome. They're just a strongly developing team that shows a ton of potential and really fun to watch live. As we were saying about Riku and Ryu being as fast as they were, I'd say nobody else in this competition was necessarily like in their league, if you will. But the rest of this lineup was very strong. And to come in third amongst them, it shows so much potential, which after last season with the U.S. pairs development of teams, I was a little worried. But this was encouraging. Yeah. I mean, there is a 20 point differential between first and third. Yeah. Over 20 point. So, you know, there's definitely some space to make up there. And and Efimova and Mitrofanov have some work to do to get into those higher echelons. And really, when we talk about that narrow divide between them and fourth, a lot of that comes down to the fourth place team of Metalkina and Berlava kind of defeating themselves. Absolutely. Because they had a rough, long program, which was crazy because their practice, their warm-up practice, they were immaculate. Flawless, at least from what I can remember. Yeah. Like, so good. Everything that we saw from them in the practice, every jump was pristine. Everything was landed. It was all terrific. But there does seem to be a disconnection in this team. Watching them in person where you often don't feel like they're really skating together. They're doing it at the same time, but not necessarily together. Yeah. And that's where we saw a few of those problems last year at, at the end of last season in the world. Here, it's that same kind of thing where like their technical content is super high. Their ability, their skating skills is super high, but they sometimes fail to keep that connection together. And when things come apart, it comes apart in really weird ways. Yeah. Like the death spiral. I don't think he actually fell on, but he put his hand back and just like... His foot slipped. Yeah. Yeah. It just failed. Well, the bigger thing is they had a side-by-side jump sequence that I think was supposed to be three jumps. And it went wrong in the middle, I think, for Luca. And he recovered and threw the third jump, but Anastasia didn't. Yeah. She seemed to have expected it to just have been over. And just sort of stopped. And it was super awkward. It looked a lot more like a practice moment than a competitive moment. And they clearly got their their wires crossed there. And it was a very messy moment. And there were just other problems throughout that program. And it was just to say shocking would be putting it mildly. I feel like the whole audience had this like universal gasp of like, whoa. But that said... They had one of the most impressive lifts I've ever seen. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) Extraordinary. I can't say enough in terms of their ability. That's obvious. But I agree with you. Like, there is very little connection between the two of them. And it ends up feeling a bit cold. Yeah. But if they had performed the way their practice had been. Oh, my gosh. They would have been far higher there because. It would have been tight between them and Riku and Ryuchi. Yeah. For sure. I think it's worth mentioning Maria Pavlova and Alexei Sviavchenko mostly because I was surprised by their scores and just by how well they didn't do, I guess, is what I'd say. I think I expected more. Yeah, they were a little underwhelming. You know, we saw them at Shanghai have some pretty big problems. They were cleaner here, but still that free skate just doesn't look like second nature to them. And they really seem to be kind of counting the beats in their head and struggling to figure out where they are at times. It wasn't as egregiously full of problems as it was at Shanghai, but it wasn't quite as good here. They're such a fun team. They have so much talent. They have so much technical ability and that technical ability really carries them. But they were certainly kind of outclassed here when it came to the performance ability. Super fun in the gala, really a fun team to watch, but a little underwhelming. Yeah. Before we move on to the women's competition, I do want to say also, I have never been particularly, not to be a downer, but never really impressed by Great Britain's Anastasia Vapen Law and Luke Digby. That changes as of being at this competition. They may not have the technical ability of the rest of these teams, but they were a joy to watch, honestly. Yeah, Vipen Law and Digby surprised me so much. Yeah, they don't have the firepower to put it big numbers, but... Their lines, the grace that they skate with. uh, She's just radiant. She is. Yeah, just in general, I was really shocked by how much I liked their performances. I felt like this was the best I'd ever seen them. And I felt like their reaction, I think they felt really good about it too. The audience received them extremely warmly. They were very impressive. And I do want to throw a quick shout out to Katie McBeath and Danelle Parkman from the U.S., 
Not a huge performance in the scores here from a fairly young team, but they're a lot of fun. They They were fun. You know, they definitely had some falls and some problems and not extraordinary technical. But I think that they're an extremely enjoyable team that given enough time that they might turn into something stronger. And I don't know. I just liked them. I thought they were they were a good time. I also don't know if it made it on screen or not, but the lift that Daniel Parkman did with Ilya at the exhibition was hilarious. Yes. I, yeah. I don't know if anybody got to see that. But yeah, like at the end when everybody was doing pictures and stuff together, Ilya and Daniel did a full blown pairs lift with Ilya way up in the air, spread eagle. <laughs> it's really impressive. Ilya's not shaken and uh, Danil is obviously plenty powerful enough. Uh, <laughs> very much so. Uh, for it. It was very fun. Well, let's talk about the women's competition, which was surprising, confusing at times, but I am thrilled with who won because Wakaba. Wakaba gets gold and I am so here for that. Wakaba Higuchi, who at 23 has been in skating competition for a long time, but kind of in and out, I think, because of injuries and stuff, had never won a Grand Prix event previously. And I don't think came into this one as a favorite for it. Certainly, I don't think she was in our predictions for that and skated beautifully here. Wonderfully. And I feel like we're starting to sound like a broken record as far as like just how enjoyable so many of these skates were. And, you know, we have the rose colored glasses of seeing it in person, which, you know, is a different experience for sure from watching it at home. But we've always liked Wakaba and to see her here perform so beautifully, not perfectly, uh, but powerfully. Yes. Yeah. There's a powerful sense to her, her skating. I won't say it's quite commanding in the way that, say, like a Kaori Sakamoto can be. But there is a warmth and a ability to grab the sentiment of the audience and get it behind her that was really strong to see. She was fourth after the short program and leapt up into that first place. But I think there's a bit of context that we should talk about here, which is just how the scores looked at this program. Yeah, this I agree. Because when you look at the top five women, there is only less than five points separating them. So it was extremely close amongst these five women, really just showing how evenly matched everyone was, but also worth stating the technical panel of judges at this women's competition were absolutely, in my opinion, reflecting the fact that under rotations, quarter turns, edge calls, those are all going to be taken very seriously, at least by them. And it kind of gave me the indication that we should expect to see more of that. It was sort of sending a message. You need to be fully rotating everything. You need to be on the right edge because they're going to call it because in third here was Isabeau Levito, for example. And I think at the end of Isabeau's performance, the crowd and Isabeau all thought she had it. And uh, no, she did not. Yeah. With Isabeau's score, with Brady's score, I think to a certain extent with Nina's score. Very much with Nina's score. Yeah. And we'll talk more about them individually in a second. But this was definitely a message that international judges want to see more refined, higher quality skates. And they're going to hammer on those technical elements. But it's looking at your top score here from Wakaba was 196.93 total. That's a pretty low scoring event for the women. When you look at Elise Lynn Gracie, who here landed in sixth, and only scored a 183, but she didn't have very strong skates here. She has the highest score of the season so far in international competition with a 213.33. So the score that she got, at, I think it was Nebelhorn, would have easily walked away with the gold here. Yeah. So this was not a big numbers event. And I think that a lot of the chatter online is a general disappointment in those levels of scores. Even if you go back to Cup of China last year, or no, I'm sorry, NHK trophy, when Ava Marie Ziegler won gold there, I think she did it with a 201. Somewhere around there. And that was, I think, the lowest scoring gold win for the women over the course of the Grand Prix last season, I think. I don't have those numbers right in front of me. Fact that, checks. Yeah, <laughs> but, um, but that's still five points higher than Wakaba yeah. won with here. So... Yeah, there'll be a lot of talk about that and what that means for the women's division. But there were a bunch of skates here that felt like they deserved bigger numbers, at least in person, and then didn't get them. Yeah, I do want to say, though, that in second place, Rinka Watanabe 
had two of the strongest skates I've seen from her. And I think she watered down her content just a little bit because she typically goes for triple axles. She brought them back down to double axles because I think she was she's playing the long game this season is basically the impression I got from her post competition interviews. And I think it's smart because she just got a silver at a Grand Prix and that sets her up really well leading into the rest of this series. Yeah, I think Rinka did this strategically in a way that really paid off for her. I mean, I've always been a fan of Rinka. I like her skating style. I like her storytelling style. And I also like that she's just a veteran competitor. I like seeing some of these older, it's weird to call them older when they're early 20s, right. but these skaters who are not kids that are out there thriving, which makes me really happy. I liked her skates here. They're not as memorable as some of the others, but she was perhaps the most consistent of all of them as far as, I mean, she was third after the short, <laughs> third after the free, landed in second, and overall looked strong. And I think that, like you said, her ceiling is much higher than what she exhibited here. So I would expect as we get further on the Grand Prix that you'll see her throw bigger things. Absolutely. As I said earlier, Isabeau Levito came in third here. She was first in the short program and her short program is beautiful. Yes. Like it is perfect on her. Change nothing, no notes. It was great. Her free skate, she was fit. I don't think anyone, especially Isabeau, was quite prepared for that after she was done because it was really lovely, but also not exciting and not nearly as complete in comparison to everything else we were seeing. It just felt like she still needs to find the voice of it. I don't know how else to say that. She definitely won over the crowd with the free oh, skate. Sure. I mean, she got a standing ovation. It looked beautiful because Isabeau is a beautiful skater. Her, Everything's a picture. Right. She's beautiful. Yeah. I will say that like as much as we've talked about the concerns that kind of everybody has about her jump technique in person, it's even more exaggerated. Watching her get so deep into her knees. And slow down so much. And slow down. Like she is quite a bit slower on the ice than a lot of the other skaters. And that's pretty noticeable at times. But also just even going into some of the jumps, she looks like she's grimacing. And I might be reading too much into it. Everybody makes me weird faces when they have to do something superhuman. Uh, <laughs> and they're all doing superhuman things out there. But I don't know that I'd ever really noticed it before until watching it in person. I do still worry about the physical toll of that jump technique. But more than anything, it seemed like she got the death by a thousand cuts yes. of under rotations and edge calls and a lot of little things that took what felt like everybody thought she was going to move into first after that free skate. Yes. And to have gotten fifth in the free skate and dropping her into third. That's a real hard thing to watch in person. Oh, it sucked the air out of the room. I really do feel like it was confusing to a lot of the audience members. I am an Isabeau fan. I love her skating. But yeah, it was just not quite there. We haven't talked too much about our predictions going into this because, you know, a lot of it's wildly wrong. I did predict Isabeau in third and I fully expected her to take first. I did it as sort of a contrarian thing, but also <laughs> just aware that it can go a lot of different ways. I absolutely thought she was going into first after the free skate and was just like everybody else floored when that score came back. But again, we couldn't identify all those problems. No. When I went back and looked at Jackie Wong's stuff in real time, he was clearly seeing those issues and was fully aware that she was not taking the top of that podium w well before those scores came back. So, he's a pro. Yes, he's a pro. It shows that there's a, there's a matter of perspective involved there. I will say, though, I was genuinely shocked by the scores of Nina Pinceroni. I'm still confused and I need to go back and roll that videotape, if you will, uh, because I'm still baffled. I thought she was wonderful in both programs and especially her short program scores sort of felt like a slap. I don't I don't know how to process them, I to be was honest. I offended at her short program score. And again, I haven't examined all the protocols on that. But if you'd left the judging to me, Nita Pizzeroni would have been on that podium. Yeah. Where on that podium? I don't know. I'm kind of back and forth on it. There's part of me that thinks that she should have actually been in silver. There's part of me that thinks that if she'd been scored the way I perceived her short program, that she would have won. She is so good. And we knew that. But watching her live she didn't get as much of the big emotional reaction out of the crowd, but her skating skills, her delivery, her technical content, all of that. Her spins. Her spins, yeah. 
And again, harping on the gala, her gala performance is next level. It's really interesting. I loved it. I could tell that the audience was very mixed. Like some of them thought it was extremely cool and inventive. Some people were a little cold. I like her perspective. She's trying a lot of different things and she has a point of view. And I'm really curious to see how she evolves as a skater. I was very impressed. I think it's also kind of interesting if you put her in context of her own national team. So if you put her against Luna Hendricks, stylistically, they're so radically different. Yeah. And I think Nina is just gone such a completely opposite direction. There's a darkness to her skating. There's a drama that I think that she's still kind of learning how to fully emote to bring out all of that. But there's definitely like real intention behind it. And I think the pairing between her and Benoit for her choreography is a very, very effective pairing. I would have liked to have seen better scores here. She's just barely off the podium. I mean, she wasn't, uh, but a little bit more than a point behind Isabeau. And she was second in the free skate. You know, justice for Nina here. I really (laughs) think that she should have been higher. I agree. And I don't know what that will mean for the rest of her Grand Prix prospects, but she is a dynamite skater. And uh, yeah, I just think she deserved a little higher. I think the other person who was shook uh, by her lack of score in the free skate was Brady Tunnell, for sure. Yeah, that was another one that kind of messed up the crowd a little bit because her free skate was really strong. And in general, I mean, just exactly what I was thinking we'd see from Brady here, which is a veteran skater who knows how to handle the pressure, who knows how to come out and really deliver in the moment when she needs to. I don't think that some of these skates are as exciting as some of the other programs the skaters have, but she delivered them really, really well. And she connects with the audience very well. And that free skate was, I mean, I was on my feet for it along with the rest of the audience. And then when you get the numbers back, sucks the air out of the room. But we've talked a lot about how Brady is a skater who traditionally has done super well domestically here in the States. But when she gets into international competition, you start seeing a lot of the little flaws get called and it tends to bring her score down. And I think just like what happened for Isabeau, it was the death by a thousand cuts and it just brought her down here. Yeah. Speaking of Jackie Wong earlier, he put it well as like she missed a Lutz and her levels weren't great. So it brought her down. And granted, competition was really tight. She wasn't that far behind. Between her and the person behind her, was, which was Elise Lynn Gracie, was almost 10 points. So that shows like there was a kind of a cutoff. Those top five skaters... You could have thrown dice in the air and any one of them could have won. Yeah, there's less than five points between Brady and Wakaba. Yeah. And had you not popped a Lutz, had somebody not had an error somewhere, had somebody not under-rotated things, things could have been very, very different. Yes. A lot of the other women kind of underperformed here, but I think that it's worth noting that while she did not look great here, Elise Lynn Gracie is a lovely skater. This competition, I think you saw the nerves. I think you saw the pressure on her. And we sort of expected that to happen, even though I think we predicted her for the podium. I definitely did. Uh, I I, I know, think you had her winning. I maybe did. <laughs> yeah, so that's fair. But I think we <laughs> talked about she doesn't have the Grand Prix experience underneath her wings the same way that a lot of these other competitors did. Exactly. And I don't think she ever came into something before with that sort of level of attention because she started the season out so strong and again, still has the highest score of any woman internationally this season. And we're going to see her again real soon because she's at Skate Canada like yeah. this week. Yeah. So she doesn't really have hot hopes for a Grand Prix final after that finish. But she does have an opportunity to make good on the Grand Prix experience at Skate Canada. Notably, the event that does seem to have the track record for the weirdest scoring of yeah. all of the events, <laughs> at least if you look at the last couple of years. So um, we'll see. And she was just a shade above Japan's Yuna Aoki in seventh. Yuna did not have flawless skates. There were definitely problems with her jumps that hindered her here. But my God, what a beautiful skater. She just, is gorgeous. And to be fair, she was 10th after the short, 4th in the long. Yeah. Um, even with the problems, because she is just that divine. Yes. Beautiful, beautiful skater. Yeah. The more we can see of her, the better. And in person, even more lovely. Well, let's finish this up with the dance. And uh, unexpected is what I will call this dance competition. You know, we often talk about how the hierarchy of dance sometimes makes it really predictable in an unfortunate way. 
wow, did this competition kind of throw a lot of that out? Out the window, things got all over the place. And I mean, I think that's good. I think that the agreed the podium should reflect how people skated there. And I think for the most part it did. I'm really happy with the podium. The way that it shook out for the top three spaces, I think, is the way it should have. But there are certainly several other teams in the mix here that did much more poorly than I think they should have. And there were some things I didn't expect. But first place here, Fear and Gibson definitively won, if on nothing else than the power of their rhythm dance, which was dynamite. Just yes. Fabulous. Even though they were kind of given an advantage because the second place team who were the favorites coming in, world champions, Madison Chalk and Evan Bates, had a fall. Yeah. And a very quick, quickly recovered from fall, but still a fall, which is pretty much the death knell <laughs> in ice dance, except that they won the free skate. So they were able to like kind of balance that out and still maintain a silver medal. But Lila and Lewis really took advantage of the situation. Could not have been more solid. If they had not won, I think it would have been so telling of kind of fake judging, I yeah. guess, for lack of a better <laughs> right, term. Yeah. They 100% took this. There is no question. Yeah. We've talked a lot about how so even this early into the season that the rhythm dance theme is not our favorite thing this nope. season. <laughs> but I think that Fearing Gibson's rhythm dance of all of them best capitalizes on the theme and they execute it beautifully. It's so fun. It's so dynamic. When they got done with it, I was like, oh, yeah, they absolutely have to be in first place going into the free dance because it was spectacular. That Beyonce free dance is still not my favorite material necessarily, but in execution, terrific. Yeah. And I think they are evolving it. Mm -hmm. I felt like this version, this iteration of it, you could already see the progress from the first time we saw it. So I do really like it. But I got to give Maddie and Evan the absolute award for maybe best overall free dance beyond just the score, more in the emotional side. Their take five jazz themed free dance. It's unbelievably beautiful and honestly a little bit moving in a weird way. For that tone, it shouldn't necessarily have that feeling. But my God, does Maddie sell the hell out of it? Not that she doesn't always. I was just so taken by the Take 5 program <laughs> that I can't stop talking. Yeah, the free dance for them here, I'm not really a big jazz fan. And so sometimes programs that lean into that can leave me a little lukewarm. But everything that they did in that free dance was spectacular. And I feel like we've gushed through a lot of stuff this episode. And I will step back to say, here's a crazy statement from Adrian, the Chalk and Bates number one fanboy. In that I don't actually like the rhythm dance. I it's don't a choice. I don't care for the way that it tries to cover the entire of the thematic of the rhythm dance theme this year by doing kind of every era and having lots of quick cuts of music. I don't think it leaves enough time for an audience to get fully connected to any one of those pieces. It just feels like somebody's changing channels on a radio station, even as good as they are. And if you discount the fall, which is a thing that happens with them sometimes. I think that Maddie can get so much into the performance that sometimes she just puts a skate wrong. So falls are one of their big struggles that does take them down sometimes. But just overall, the rhythm dance didn't please me. I would like to see a better version of that. But the free dance is next level. It is champion material. There's still people we haven't seen in competition this season. I think it's going to be really, really hard for anybody to do something that's better than that free dance because it is magnificent. It's magical. I really want to talk about Olivia Smart and Tim Deke because, my God, how excited I was that they are on this podium. Love that they finally got some respect. This might be my favorite part of the ice dance competition is a podium placement for Smart and Deke. Yes. And they are well back. From the top two. Oh, for uh, sure. Point wise, you know, so there is a 16 point differential there. So there's some space and they were fifth after the rhythm. And that rhythm dance is terrific. I mean, like there's so much fun. It suits them really, really well. However, when we've seen them in earlier in the season, pre Grand Prix, 
their Dune program had some issues. It was already a fairly stunning program, but with a lot of little flaws, including a pretty ambitious lift that they had a super bad fall on that just wrecked one of their competitions. And I think they took a lot of criticism from basically online trolls after that performance. And we were wondering how they would repair that program, whether or not they would leave that lift in. They did, and that lift is gorgeous. I don't know how it sells on TV in person. It is so impressive. They got a new outfit for Olivia for the free dance, which I think Madison Chalk designed. Designed, yeah. And it's a thousand percent improvement over what they had previously. And they just brought that program all together. And so the promise of what it had that we did not see delivered earlier in the season, we saw on display here and it was magnificent. I'm just so glad the judges actually acknowledged it because I do feel like they have been underscored. I know I've said this before. So getting that score that they really earned was just wonderful to see. And man, I think I had said it while we were there. Like if I had had any stuffies, they would have gone directly to Olivia Smart. I love her. (laughs) She's amazing. And so getting to see them be rewarded for what they did was really, really wonderful. It was great to see them in the kiss and cry after the free dance and actually get scores that they felt good about. Because even after the rhythm dance, you could tell they were still like, oh, that's not what we wanted to see even after it was as good as it was. But for them to finally get on the podium, this is validation for this team who have only been together for a season and change now. So to step up to this level, again, even though point wise, they're still well behind the top two teams here. But to get on a podium at a Grand Prix while the rest of this competition was no slouch. There was a lot of other really good teams, but numerically things get real weird after this. Everything got weird after this. So in fourth, you have Diana Davis and Gleb Smolkin, who, to be fair, were solid. They were solid. Do I think that they should have been in fourth? No. I think their free dance was much better than their rhythm dance. I like that free dance to Zeppelin. Yeah. I I I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. However, right behind them, you had Lena Set and Artem Markolov back quite a ways by about eight points behind them. But then behind that team, which is fresh to senior competition, they are exceptional. They were the Grand Prix and World Junior Champions last season and extremely talented and very good here were Ratsakova and Mrazek in sixth and Canadians Laurent and Legac in eighth. And I am baffled, frankly, by some of those placements. I would have scrambled that whole list. In, yeah. To my mind, Laurel and Legac should have been in fourth. I would have put the Mirazic siblings in fifth. Yes. Uh, kind of a toss up for me between Davis and Smolkin and Nasset and Markolov. Nasset and Markolov were terrific here. Absolutely um, terrific. And I think sometimes that's a team that are more flashy than refined. Her incredible flexibility and their ability to just make wild shapes with her and just twist her into knots. And (laughs) at the same time, I think that if you step back from all of those big flashy bits, there's maybe a little less of a story. There's a little bit less of an emotional component. It's a lot of the way that I felt about Zingus and Kolsnick in the past, that sometimes that they are a team that is a lot of flash, but not a lot of heart. And to a degree, that's kind of how I felt about Nasset and Markalov, even as much as I was impressed because they're so much fun to watch. They are. Oh, and they're brilliant. They're, they're really, really cool. I will say they terrify me in the warmups. They almost took out so many people. Yes. They <laughs> feel very unaware of themselves. And they're still young. So that makes sense. Sure. And I've heard other people talk before about the Moravsic siblings because they're so fast being a, a little bit of a, a threat on ice, but like. Just in the warm-ups for these skates, we saw numerous very close calls. Oh, yeah. And it very often seemed to be Nisette and Markalov just kind of putting themselves in the wrong place right while somebody else was going into an element. Close calls are natural and normal. They happen a lot. But some of them were definitely the, oh, oh my gosh, you oh, yeah. just there was took a one, blade. One point where Nisette almost took out Evan Bates and it was like 
holding your breath, like, no, 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 no. Okay. It's okay. Yeah. It was like by inches. <laughs> yeah. It was, uh, yeah, it was kind of freaky, but, but yeah, just in general, I felt like all of those teams were, their scoring was a little odd, but particularly Laurent and the Gok. I know that they, they got a deduction. I think it was for music, like the timing of their music. It was like a one section didn't have the right tempo. Something like that. Um, mm. But also, I want to say, like, I don't even know if I was aware of how good Maratsakova and Maratsik are. And I know that they are not the most crowd pleasing. Like you could tell in the building that they didn't necessarily sell to everybody. They are so talented. I was so impressed with them. And when their scores would come up, I was really disappointed. I'm like, they're a really fabulous team. And Daniel just seems so sweet. He just kept coming over to the boards just saying, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Like, he was just really nice. So I was disappointed on that one. But I agree. Like, Laurent and Lagak scores, I expected them to be on the podium. I'm genuinely baffled by some of that. Yeah, they had me a little on the big mad side. To yeah. be fair... They did miss an entire lift in their free dance. So I, I don't know if it was a lift or just a small element, but something just, it was just gone. didn't pick up. It didn't yeah. work. It didn't happen. So them falling from the podium, I get. But their scores in every other way just threw me for a loop. But I also want to mention Fabri and Air came in last. They were fourth after the rhythm dance. She had a really bad fall in the free so i think that's what saw them drop so far but yeah i mean she are... literally fell into the splits oh i know it was it looked painful but they were really strong much stronger than i think i've given them credit for in the past so it's me owning i think they're a much better team than i i realized yeah for and Air are definitely a team that i i don't typically find super memorable in the rhythm dance i really like them a lot it was yes. a shame to watch them fall here and just, I mean, to look at the other teams, this is the Senior Grand Prix debut of Tachinko and Kilikov, who were so good in the junior ranks last year. She has huge amounts of star power. They're very committed to their bit. I don't think these programs are going to elevate them in a big way in their current state. I think they just underperformed here. It left them in eighth. Uh, and honestly, like, had there not been more problems like Fribri and Air, I think that they should have been a little bit lower. Agreed. I will say, though, like, they were a last minute add on because of the loss of Flores and Destoyev, which is a whole other weird story. Yeah, we'll talk about that another time, but that's that's not so great. But your last minute substitutions of Annabelle Morozov and Jeffrey Chen, you know, they got thrown into this super last minute, but I really like that team. They're a ton of fun. They're, you know, not nearly as strong technically as a lot of the other teams yet. But I think that when you've looked at Jeffrey Chen's earlier partnerships that always just got very lukewarm receptions and were never very competitive in the grand scheme of things, they look better as a team than I think anybody that we've seen them with before. Annabelle has just big, bright energy. Like She's great. She's really, really engaging on ice. They seem to vibe really well together, and both these programs are energetic and crowd-pleasing. And even though the numbers don't show a giant success here, I did think they were really good, and I'm looking forward to seeing more from them. I agree, but I do feel like it is time to wrap up. And if you have stayed with us this long, you deserve a medal. Maybe you're gold in our heart this week. <laughs> I know we have gushed and fallen all over ourselves to talk about our first competition in person in maybe like 14 years. So uh, thank you. But yeah, I mean, I, well, I think that does transition us to gold in our hearts. Uh, this one's not going to be hard. We, I think it's pretty obvious. It's pretty, pretty obvious. It's, it's Kevin Amos. Amos. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what much more there is to say other than he was extraordinary. It was everything we wanted from him and more. I wish I could put a gold medal around his neck and tell him that he is divine. Yeah. I think I've used that word too much this episode, but it is how I felt. This whole episode probably has to be taken with a grain of salt. Yeah. Just because being in person and it being our first competition that we've been to in over a decade. It's intoxicating. Yeah. There is something very special about seeing skating live. We had, I thought, a great audience at this event, but, Agreed. um, and our section was very full. So we always felt like we had a ton of people around us, but you could look around the arena and see that it was not a full space, even for a, a fairly small venue. Like there was not a full house crowd when we were out and about in Allen, Texas, and we would talk to servers and Uber drivers and people at stores. Nobody knew that event was going on. 
and I get like skating is a niche sport, so you're not necessarily going to be super aware of it, but it seems like even just advertising it in the town where it's happening was extremely minimal. That continues to be a problem for this sport, a federation that just doesn't seem to have the money to push things in a big way. And that's a whole conversation for another dedicated episode about what needs to happen for this sport to get out and get more people involved. But considering how good so much of this was, I wish that more people had been there to witness it. Because even as deafening as those standing ovations were for Kevin Amos, because again, spectacular, and he got it every time he was on the ice. And uh, I think even when he got his scores, I think people stood up like it was uh, it was a lot of standing. Yes. My hands hurt after the event was over just from clapping, but it would have been great to have had full houses for it. And I heard from other people who were at the event that they were in spaces that were much thinner and they felt it, you know, that energy difference when they were in spots where there weren't as many people. But I do like that venue and it has free parking, which I mean... <laughs> I mean, from where we're at, that's amazing, yes, right? Yes, that uh, is a novelty I was not expecting. <laughs> yeah, didn't work out so great for our car that didn't function after a day, but still really cool for the actual event. For so. everyone else. But with that, I think we should uh, bid everyone a fond farewell and uh, a reminder that we'll be back soon with uh, Skate Canada because... We're now in the thick of things. Yeah, now we're in the week after week of events. So Skate Canada, some of these people are going to be right back in it, uh, you know, a week later. So a lot of big names are going to be there. Like I said, Skate Canada tends to be the one where the scoring feels a little weird. So hopefully that is not the case at this one. But we get Alyssa Liu back on the Grand Prix. That is really exciting. We will see the debut this season of Piper and Paul. And of my babies, Le Joie and Le Gars. Oh my gosh, Lala. So, yeah, I mean, there's a lot to look forward to in this coming event. So we will talk to you again after Skate Canada. So let us know in the comments if you were at the event. Did you experience it in the same way we did? And does it feel quite different from watching on TV? If you're watching it from home. Tell us what we got wrong. What was your perspective from that? Were you as aware of the scoring and like, you know, were you surprised when like, say, like Brady and Isabeau? underperformed or was that more obvious at home i'd be really curious to see what you guys have to say about it and who was gold in your heart and why was it kevin amos there's only one answer (laughs) (laughs) and for choreography i'm adrian buskey and i'm wendy buskey and we'll talk to you next time bye